Thanks again, Jared. <clears throat> okay, so welcome everybody. We'll be uh, just switching gears uh, here and we'll be talking about elastography. Now, elastography is something that is widely done, and not only in the United States. This time I went to India and everybody was doing elastography even there. So it's quite a, I would say it's disheartening to know that we don't do it here. As I understood from Dr. D is that when we get the three Tesla MRI scanner, the uh, deal includes the elastography ultrasound as well. So till that big three Tesla deal goes through, then the accompaniment is this elastography machine. I don't know if it's coming free with it or it's a, you know, one with one free or I don't know if one fifty percent off. What's the deal? I don't know. But I know this, that we all should know this. We all should at least know the physics behind it. And uh, I don't know, did you have any questions uh, in your boards this time? Uh, any board takers? Piyush, were there any questions on elastography? I think there was one. There was but one. I'm not sure if I did it correctly or not. Yeah. They showed an ultrasound image of the liver, oh. and there were some other uh, measurements or, or line diagrams inside that uh, image. Yeah, that could be that. Was it like a, a colorful, like uh, hues of green, blue, red? Yes. There was, yeah, so that was probably an astrography I, question. I, I don't think I had that question. I did have one about not an image, but just what can you grade or something by elastography. Correct. Okay. So anyway, nonetheless, we will, um, I will, I have uh, planned three lectures for elastography. Um, I apologize, but this one is going to be a very wordy presentation. There are hardly any images on it. And would you mind closing that, shutting that door, please? Thank you so much. And uh, we need to know a little bit about the physics and what the definitions are before we can actually go on to images. But uh, uh, in sequential three lectures, we will complete everything there is to do with elastography. OK, so the first slide is a blank slide. And I, if I want all of you to start blank. I want all of you to think. I don't want to expect you to know anything about it. Uh, if you know anything about it, unknow it. So we're going to start fresh as a team. We're going to go forward, and uh, we're going to get um, uh, acquainted with this uh, new dimension of ultrasound. So this is what elastography or elasticity is for me. I mean, really, before I read all these papers and made all these lectures, it was just elasticity of you know maybe an underwear or jeans or something. That's all I thought was elasticity. But as in, I divulged into it, you know, more and more and more, I realized it's like an ocean, and there's lots of stuff to do. All right, so we need to know the physics, uh, unfortunately, but um, we will uh, do it slowly. And if you need to take a break, let me know. So elastography is a non-invasive technique of imaging stiffness or elasticity of tissues by measuring movement or transformation of tissue in response to a small applied pressure. So very easy. I mean, you, it has to be an external source of pressure. There has to be either a probe or, a, or something that is causing the external application of pressure, like maybe you know something on it. And then we are going to be measuring that how much is the compression of the tissues, number one, and how much is the recoil of the tissues after we remove the compression. So that's basically what we're doing. When you have a slab of cheese, and you compress it, and then you let go. It's pretty much that's what we're doing. But here we're going to do it um, uh, with an ultrasound probe, and there are going to be several measures of Pascal's and so on and so forth in the last So again, it's we're imaging the stiffness or elasticity of tissues by measuring the movement or transformation or deformation of tissues in response to a small applied pressure. So it's like a virtual palpation. Okay, so what is that? Which can overcome the subjectivity flaw and provide objective as well as quantitative measure of tissue stiffness, right? So we all in our clinical years, we have gone and palpated maybe liver masses or palpated the abdomen. And everybody's subjectivity is different. Somebody said oh, it's soft, somebody said it's doughy, somebody said it's tense, somebody said whatever. So that subjectivity will come out. Everybody will now talk through numbers. So what is stress? Stress, it is defined as force per unit area. And the unit of stress is Pascal. OK, there you go. So this is what is stress. It's just force applied per unit area. Stress can be due to compression or shear. Compression is which acts perpendicular to the surface and causes shortening of an object. Like I said, there's cheese, and you compress it. So the, the, this is horizontal, and you're putting perpendicular force on it. So you're compressing it. So that is going to be your compressive stress. And shear stresses, which acts parallel to the surface and causes deformation. So you can have uh, stress from here to here. So anything that goes parallel to this, like when you have 
This is the shear stress, okay? So it runs parallel to uh, each other. The other one runs perpendicular, this one runs parallel. So this is the two types of stress, and we're gonna be talking a lot about shear uh, in the next couple of slides. So uh, uh, just to, uh, wait, wait. now tensional stress is something that is inbuilt within the, um, uh, let's say when there's a comminuted fracture, right? There's obviously an inbuilt impact, and then blood, soft tissue, et cetera, comes into the um, uh, fragments, and that causes expansion or enlargement or distraction of the fracture fragments, right? That's tension stress, okay? There's comminution, there's a force that was transmitted to the, let's say the radius or the ulna, and then there was a lot of blood, there was fragmentation, and then that causes enlargement. Compressional stress, like I told you, was perpendicular. It is applied perpendicular to it, and it causes side-to-side -side compression, right? This is uh, uh, the object. This is 90 degrees to this line. This is 90 degrees to this side. So that causes side-to-side -side compression. Shear stress, this is going forward. This is coming backward. Like I explained to you, shear stress is like friction. So it goes side-to-side. -side. So, so far, so good. So we have a few more definitions before we can actually get into the meat of it. Strain. When subjected to stress, an object tends to undergo a deformation of its original size and shape. Again, think of the cheese. If you apply some stress, it'll you know, become squishy or become the, um, the length or the height of it will become shorter. Undergo a deformation of its original size and shape. The amount of deformation is known as strain. So even this deformation is measurable and that is known as strain. And ultrasound machines can measure this strain. Unit less expressed as change in length per unit length of the object. So this deformation is change in length per unit length. That is a long uh, 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 unit to remember, but that is how you will measure what is deformation of the object, right? It's stress of an object that causes not only change in shape, but size. We'll come to that a little more. What is elasticity? It is the property of the materials to return back to its original state original form after the stress is removed, right? That's why I showed you that elastic mommy genes, you know, when you let go of the mommy genes, it comes back, that's elastic. If you let go of something else, so elasticity is the property, is that once the stress has been taken away, how does this, how much of the original shape, how much of the original size is kept in form? Oh, everybody is with me? Any confusion? Nothing, okay, good. Now we need to know a little bit about the basics of human tissue elasticity because we'll be dealing with human issues essentially. What happened, Dan? You're not interested? No, he got a page to write that. He has oh. uh, not interested? He is? <laughs> okay, good. Now tissue stiffness is generally measured by a physical quantity called the Young's modulus and expressed in pressure units, that is pascals or kilopascals. So what is this tissue stiffness? So if we go back, we have spoken about just about everything. And what is, um, so stiffness is basically the resistance to change, right? If I, uh, um, uh, if I, no matter how much pressure I apply on this uh, metallic screen or metallic phone, I'm not being able to change it. But on cheese, yes, I will. So that is the measure of stiffness. That is what is stiffness. It's generally measured by a physical uh, quantity called the Young's modulus and expressed in pascals or kilopascals. The Young's modulus is defined simply as the ratio between the applied stress and the induced strain. Does that make sense? The applied stress, how much stress we're applying, and how much strain is perceived by that body tissue. Obviously, if you're going to be applying, let's say, one kilopascal on um, the skin, you're going to be able to deform it. But if you apply the same one kilopascal onto bone, nothing's going to happen because the tissue stiffness of bone is higher than that of skin. Everybody is with me? Are there any questions? Okay, so we know what is shear, we know what is stiffness, we know exactly what it is. So stiffness is pretty much the resistance of the tissue to the stress, the applied stress. Young's modulus or elasticity, E, quantifies tissue stiffness. Hard tissues have higher Young's modulus than softer ones, like I explained, the skin and the bone. So this is just a little bit of numbering right here so that we can get to know what we're talking about. Now remember, the applications of elasticity or the applications of elastography are very high in the breast, the prostate, and the liver. Uh, I will go through each one of them in my subsequent lecture, so we'll be just done with elastography and all. So normal fat 
as you can imagine, fat, like being wobbly, like nothing else, has a very low Young's modulus, right, 18 to 24. Compare that to glandular tissue, it raises up to 28 to 66, fibrous tissue getting into the hundreds, and carcinoma being into the mid hundreds, right? So as you come into tissues from fat to normal glandular to, to more fibrous tissue, and then to carcinoma, as you know, carcinoma will be very densely fibrotic, like introductal carcinoma is a scurrus tumor, it's got a lot of fibrous tissue in it, the uh, elasticity or the Young's modulus will go on increasing. So far, so good. Likewise, prostate, normal prostate is, you know, about 55 to 71. Benign prostatic hyperplasia is less than normal prostate and prostatic carcinoma. Any carcinoma usually will harden the tissue because that is what it does, right? Remember we read in pathology in duration and so on and so forth and all that, those kind of desmoplastic changes. That is what will cause carcinomas to have a higher Young's modulus. In the liver, again, normal will have be very, very low, less than 10, and a cirrhotic liver will be higher than that, uh, getting close to uh, late 80s to 100. Does that make sense? So the applications in the liver are definitely for cirrhosis, to pick up early cirrhosis in the sense, like you can just I diagnose cirrhosis totally non-invasively. You don't even need to do a random liver biopsy. Right, that's our final goal. And of course, we're going to be looking at liver masses, liver masses, etc., and we're going to define whether they are benign or malignant. Does that make sense? All right, so this was just an idea to give you uh, what the Young's modulus is and how tissue elasticity responds to it. Now, how does this exactly work? There are three steps in the methodology of any elastography response. So firstly, you've got to generate a low frequency vibration in a tissue to induce a shear stress, right? You've got to induce some kind of shear stress. Could be vibration. Um, the initial or the older models, we were actually um, Put, putting in mechanical pressure, but that is no longer done. Now this vibration is inbuilt in the probe. So number one, generating a shear stress, a source of shear stress. And second, image the tissue with the goal of analyzing the resulting stress. And we keep looking at the tissue and we see that we've put in some shear stress. What is it doing to the tissue? So we now start to analyze the stress on that tissue type, right? Third is, deduce from this analysis a parameter related to tissue stiffness. I mean, you finally want to give it a number. Finally, it should fall into some number. When you look, when you look in the breast, you say, oh, it's 74. So 74 is either normal glandular tissue or fibrous tissue. So ultimately, it has to be a number. So an applied stress, you're then uh, you're going to see some color hues, and then you're going to see what the stress is doing to the tissue. And number three is going to generate a number where you can look at a large a uh, reference chart and find out what actually is the composition of that tissue. If the Young's modulus or elasticity of the tissue can be determined directly from the analysis, the technique is considered to be quantitative. If I can at the end of my procedure give you a number, it's a quantitative analysis, right? Because I'm giving you a quantity, I'm giving you a number. So that's called a quantitative analysis. Everybody is with me? So apply stress, see what the stress is doing to the tissue, come up with a number. Simple as that. Now, there are certain types of elastography, but there are thankfully just two or three types, so we don't have to uh, divulge much into it. Elastography techniques are commonly classified according to the type of incoming vibration applied to the tissue, right? Incoming vibration. There are three classes of elastography, static, dynamic, and shear wave based. Right now, most of the advanced uh, machines only use shear wave based uh, elastography. Okay, what is static elastography? Static elastography uses a uniform compression at the surface of the body to cause deformation of tissue. Understandable, right? That's the first form. You're putting a mechanical pressure on the skin or soft tissue and seeing how much deformation that causes. The compression is applied by the user and the ultrasound scanner calculates and displays this is the in and displays the induced deformation on the imaging plane, right? You're putting in, let's say, one pascal or how much ever shear st stress, no, sorry, how static stress that you're putting on onto the skin surface. The ultrasound scanner will calculate and display how much deformation is caused on that image. So far, so good. Young's modulus cannot be reconstructed as the stress within the tissues induced is unknown. Right? You cannot calculate it. This Young's modulus is exclusive to shear stress. Okay? You cannot use this in static cases. Okay, so this is, a, like I said, this is not, the new generation elastography scanners do not show this, but we need to know this. So let's look at the static elastography. This is a B-mode image, and this is its corresponding elastogram. So this is the lesion that we're talking about, right? It's very subtle. 
it's very superficial but the elastography image not only causes a lot of contrast in the image black versus white versus gray uh, it also gives us some more information on the elastogram the less deformed tissue appears darker so it says that you applied this is the elastography probe this was the old probe where it has a soft component and then it has a hard component and this hard component or the mechanical component is the one that causes maximum or majority of the pressure so it's telling us this image is telling us the static image is telling us that this black area or the dark area was less deformed less deformed means it's worrisome correct the tissues that are easily deformed are usually benign tissues the tissues that are hard to deform so are, have the ones that have desmoplastic reaction have tumor or carcinoma in it so it told us that this lesion is not a benign lesion it's got not only this particular lesion right here but even the surrounding tissues show desmoplastic response because this dark area is wider and taller than this area seen on b mode so this was a malignant lesion as far as static elastography is concerned everybody is with me i know it's boring i'm sorry but uh, we have to start here now coming to dynamic elastography so dynamic elastography as the name suggests utilizes a continuous vibration right as opposed to static put pressure let go of the pressure this is a continuous low monochromatic vibration stationary waves induced in the body are analyzed to deduce the tissue elasticity so you can be put anywhere and maybe let's say there uh, the entire right breast or the right arm or except wherever the region of interest is they're going to be bombarding some low vibration or low stationary waves to that area dynamic elastography is well suited for mr systems as a vibration pattern is not time dependent and must be assessed in a volumetric data so mr elastography is basically is what uses the dynamic elastography it is a quantitative approach but suffers from usual mr drawbacks it's got a high cost limited availability and lack of real time imaging so dynamic elastography even though it is dynamic it lacks its real time imaging because you are you cannot interrupt the pulse if you interrupt the pulse by either moving the arm away or putting in a probe or coming into the field of view you will lose the information about, uh, about the tissue elasticity so this is what uh, like i said it's used in the mr scanner this is the dynamic elastography and uh, so this is uh, the breast right everybody can make out this is the breast everybody is going to sleep that i can see mc piyush everybody is fast asleep please wake up i know it is a uh, sleepy thing dr yeah is mcd are you awake okay you are awake okay just checking huh? i thought as much with what to do if you don't know this we can't really uh, get to the images okay so this is the area of interest on this mri image what let me see your mri fellow is here our breast fellow uh okay you are here okay wonderful So this is the area of concern on this breast, right? And this is the uh, dynamic or real-time elastography images, which is giving this series of color hues. And this more the red, the more stiff it is, right? More the red, the less elastic it is. Okay, all right. Now coming to shear wave elastography. Please wake up now. This is really uh, necessary to be awake on this part of the conference. Sorry. Okay, shear wave elastography. Shear wave is based. A shear wave based elastography makes use of transient pulses. to generate shear waves in the body so it's not a continuous wave form like the dynamic shear wave like, sorry like the dynamic pulse this is a shear wave which is a transient or pulsed uh waves to generate uh, shear waves in the body the tissue's elasticity is directly deduced by measuring the speed of the wave propagation so a continuous uh, uh a wave is coming with a shear pulse in it shear pulse is parallel to whatever organ you're interested in it's not perpendicular remember that and then as it's coming in there is a method of deduction on the elastography screen itself that will tell you how the different tissues are reacting to this shear stress Shear wave based elastography is the only approach able to provide quantitative and local elastic information in real time. So therefore this is the only shear wave elastography the one that we use in ultrasound. Does that make sense? Because it can generate a number and ultimately you won't want to be as specific as a number so you can look at a reference chart and say you know I think this is benign leave it alone or I think it's malignant let's go ahead with excision or with an excisional biopsy. So you want to provide more quantitative information and uh, 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 local elastic information in real time. Shear wave elastography uses the acoustic radiation force 
induced by ultrasound beams to perturb underlying tissue. So you, of course you're going to be, have some form of disturbance or some form of shear stress to perturb the underlying tissues. This pressure or acoustic wind pushes the tissues in the direction of propagation. So this is, uh, you know, let's say this is the lesion right here you're interested in and this is the shear wave. So this shear wave is going to go in the direction of the lesion and will cause the deformation of the lesion in the same plane. It will cause that lesion to move anteriorly. So the stress is coming posteriorly and moving the lesion anteriorly. So that is how the shear stress comes. An elastic medium such as human tissue will react to this push by a restoring force. Of course, for every equal action there is, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So every lesion in the human body or every tissue in the human body will try to resist that shearing force by a restoring force. This force induces mechanical waves and more importantly shear waves that propagate transversely in the tissue. So it is that resistance, inherent resistance of the tissue that resist its deformation that we're going to measure by the Young's modulus, which is the elasticity. Any questions? You understood everything? Okay. So uh, just a very, um, so they're saying that there is a propagating pulse that is coming at one milliseconds, six milliseconds, and 13 milliseconds. As you see, if the pulse is coming from anterior to posterior, it tries to, initially there is no deformation of the tissue. Further on, it causes deformation of tissue a little bit. And if you keep the pulse or the, the thing propagated, generated, it causes deformation of the tissue. You see that? So more and more you keep at it, it causes deformity of the tissue. Advances in shear wave imaging are spatially modulated ultrasound, also known as SMURFs. So it's called spatially modulated ultrasound radiation force, supersonic shear wave imaging, and axial shear strain imaging. Fortunately, we'll have to go through um, uh, each of them later, not now. Now, what are the applications of uh, uh, elastography in breast, prostate, thyroid, liver, treatment monitoring response to chemotherapy, radiotherapy, intravascular strain imaging, cardiac elastography, deep venous thrombosis, and kidney transplant monitoring. So there are a lot of applications, and each of these applications are going to be tested upon because it's, like I said, uh, uh, I don't think there is any institution in this country that is not doing elastography but us or maybe very few that are not doing it, that's what I meant to say. But that doesn't mean we don't need to know about it. We need to know about this because we'll soon get a machine. I was hoping with the date I got was July of next year. So if you're all ready and everything with it, we'll just hop onto it. So even though I don't primarily do breast imaging, I would like to take the opportunity to show you a few images and uh, the concept of elastography will become very clear with this. Compared to grayscale ultrasound, malignant lesions tend to be larger and more irregular on elastography, likely secondary to stiff peripheral desmoplastic reaction. Remember we said that. On B-mode imaging, if you're measuring a lesion to be one centimeter in size, let's say in the right breast, on elastography, that will be at least one and a half centimeters. Because not only is the lesion stiff, but the surrounding desmoplastic reaction or the local infiltration of that tissue into the normal glandular parenchyma is also stiff. So it tells you that, you know, this is the lesion, but this surrounding area is locally infiltrated as well. When measuring lesion size on elastography, the lesion should be measured in exact position on both elastogram and B-mode image because the elastogram image will overestimate the size of the, the true size of the lesion. Understandable? Let's look at this. So firstly, I just want to acquaint you, this is an elastography screen, okay? It has a B-mode screen below, like a regular B-mode screen, and an elastography screen superior to it. Then it has uh, a scale, like you have your red and blue scale on a color Doppler or spectral Doppler image, and it tells you that the harder lesions are red, the ones that are very stiff or very inelastic are red, and as you come to the spectrum of yellow to blue to or green to blue it becomes softer and softer so any tumor or any desmoplastic reaction should be red am i right because it's hard and the harder you are or the uh, the more red you are the more inelastic you are does that make sense okay so in this lesion let's say it says heterogeneous echotexture irregular shape and uh, let's look at that the color scale is a measure of stiffness we talked about that um, uh, we, we talked about that so anyway, this was a lesion right here. Now, uh, um, Dr. Mathur, now looking at these images, would you think it's primarily a benign lesion or is it a malignant lesion? What would you think? 
it looks malignant, right? So it's got these lobulated margin that's probably taller than wider, and it's got these finger-like projections that are uh, uh, emanating from it. Anyway, so when you're not sure or you think this could even be a fibroadenoma, put on these images. So this shows us that there are two areas of intense inelasticism or increased hardness or redness over here. And this is just as far as elastography is concerned, this is malignant. This is malignancy other, uh, unconsidered otherwise, and this turned out to be intraductal carcinoma. Does that make sense? Let's look at another image. Here, uh, yet another lesion which was hypoechoic seen in the superficial tissues of the breast. And you see that it has got some marginal lobulation. It's got a little bit of teeth-like impression here. It's got a finger-like projection here. Not sure whether this is a, a fibroadenoma. Not sure whether this is a malignant lesion. Put on your elastogram and you see it is intensely red. So not only is this red, but even all this is red, right? It overshoots, it overflows. So all this was desmoplastic reaction with the central uh, introductal carcinoma and the surrounding tissues are blue they're getting to be from uh, you know from light blue to dark blue or electric blue and it's getting from near benign to benign does that make sense right here you see that in the left breast at 12 o'clock position anteradial there is another lesion again this is showing some marginal lobulation it's showing some finger like projections but over here I only see blue so what does this mean EMS is it a benign lesion or a malignant lesion it's a benign lesion. Do I need to follow it up? Do I need to do anything about it? No, I can confidently call it like a BIRADS2 if, if I need to correlate with a mammogram. I'm very confident now that this is a very benign lesion, right? But on this, I would not be sure because this doesn't look too indifferent from this. Look at this and then look at this. I mean, they're not too dissimilar, right? But here, elastography tells us that it's very elasticity of these tissues is very, very high. So this is not desmoplastic reaction. So benign lesions demonstrating homogeneous oval shape with a very soft elastogram, right? It's a very soft elastogram, which also appears the same size on both grayscale and shear wave elastography. So whatever you were able to see here is the same size over here. Let's look at this again. So this was a fibroadenoma, why it's well marginated, and it's got a soft elastogram. Now, complex cyst versus solid lesions. Again, like every modality, yes? Is it monitoring in, in D mode and elastography mode at the same time? Like, are those images required at the same moment? Yes, yes. Okay. So you are looking, a patient comes in, you'd acquire this image, right? Right here. And to this lesion is where you're sending the shear wave pulses. So you identify the lesion of interest. I mean, you cannot scan an entire breast with this. You can only scan targeted lesions that you are uh, iffy about. You know, is it benign, malignant? I don't know. So you look at this lesion and you say, I'm not sure whether this is benign or malignant. And then you put on your elastogram and it will provide shear stress to this lesion and see what the response of this tissue is to that shear stress. Is it hard? Is it, that means is it not elastic? Or is it elastic? What is the Young's modulus? It'll come up with a number and see the 104, 78, 52 is 26. The higher the number, the more the stiffness of the value. The more the young, the higher the Young's modulus, the less elastic the tissue is. Make sense? So this was again a fibroadenoma based on the fact that when you applied shear stress or uh, to this uh, lesion, it came up with a soft elastogram. Make sense? So complex cyst versus solid lesions. Elastography has the potential to differentiate complicated cysts from solid masses. Many times on ultrasound, if you have thick, inspissated fluid collections within the complex cyst, like pus or blood, you may not always see the posterior acoustic um, uh, shine through, right? You may not always see the uh, propagation of, uh, uh, of the beam beyond the lesion. Shear wave propagation does not occur in cysts, and therefore cysts should have elastography values of zero and will almost mostly lack or homogeneity be blue on the color overlay elastogram. So when you were thinking that this, is it a complex cystic mass lesion or is this a soft solid tumor, elastography will come to the rescue. So this is a simple cyst, large simple cyst. Obviously this is, because there is simple, this has no elastography. It has an elastography of zero. It doesn't have any number. So it will not pick up any blue hues also, even though it's benign. So remember, when you see an image like this on the examination, the answer is a cyst, right? It's not benign, it's not malignant, it's a cyst. There is no elastography response. As Let's read why. Because elastography responses of simple cysts will have value of zero and will appear mostly black or homogeneously blue on the color overlay sonogram. So here it's homogeneously black. Let's look at this lesion. So this was noted to be a complicated cyst. What is this artifact called? 
Do you have a C? Through transmission. Correct. So this is a posterior acoustic enhancement or through transmission. So based, excuse me, based off this, one thought that this was a complicated cyst. But just to be sure, put on your elastogram. It's a very soft elastogram. And therefore, this is a benign lesion. OK, uh, this is something peculiar. It's called the bullseye artifact. Just take a look at this. A bullseye artifact has also been described as a characteristic feature of benign breast cysts. Even though it's just a cyst, and it may show no elastogram, but it is target of the bullseye view is um, where fluid, central fluid may appear bright with a surrounding dark ring. This is one artifact of elastography, but it is a beneficial artifact because it lets us know that the lesion that we're thinking about is a benign cyst. Yes, you see. Yes, the static elastograms were black and white. The shear wave elastograms are color hues from red to blue. Okay. Uh, we don't really do the static ones, but that doesn't mean they won't be tested upon. That's what I meant to say. I mean, we don't do IVPs. We don't do so many things, but they come on the tests, right? Okay. Now, uh, what? When? When does? When does elastography come to the rescue? It's a very good problem-solving tool. That's very important. Elastography has the potential to downgrade BIRADS 4A lesion to a BIRADS 3. So, what's a BIRADS 4A, um, Dr. Mathur? Three. And three. Probably benign. So thank you. So in a BIRADS 3 situation, is it a six monthly uh, visit? Is am I right? Yes. Patient visit six monthly. And in a 4A, uh, action needs to be taken right away. Correct? Thank you, Dr. Mathur. So it has the potential to downgrade the BIRADS 4A lesion to a BIRADS 3 using qualitative shear wave elastography and color assessment of lesion stiffness oval shape and a maximum elastic elasticity value of less than 80 kilopascals without a significant loss in sensitivity. So when you're thinking the lesion is 4A, put on your elastogram and let's see if the, what number it comes up with. What is the Young's modulus? If it comes up with a number 80 or lower, downgrade it to 3. It's saying this has got a very a high sensitivity to this lesion. So that is number 1, downgrading 4A lesions to 3. Elastography may also be used to identify oval circumscribed cancers detected on ultrasound and may be used to upgrade a BIRADS 3 lesion to BIRADS 4A. So what does that mean? One of the features of benignity on breast ultrasound is that it has got a very smooth or a very uh, unlobulated margin. Am I right? It always says, look at the margin, look at the margin. If it's well circumscribed, smooth contours, right away you think it's probably fibroadenoma. I'm not going to do anything about it. But put on it. Put on elastography, and if you see a color hue change from red or the orange, whatever, it is upgraded to BIRADS 4. You see what I'm saying? So essentially, you're buying time. I mean, you would have not detected this lesion till maybe another six month visit when it started to show some outpouchings or uh, undular, un, you know, nodularities on the surface, or maybe yet another six months. So here you saved like one year. So you may have saved this patient some, uh, 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 definitely you've saved her a lot of morbidity. Furthermore, elastography feature analysis also has a potential to downgrade BIRADS 3 lesions to BIRADS 2 lesions, like I showed you, like fibroadenomas, which were you thinking was probably benign, but I'm going to call the patient back in six months. You put on your elastogram, and it's totally a blue elastogram, a, a soft elastogram. It's a fibroadenoma. Patient comes back in a year. Make sense? Let's look at this. So this is an oval circumscribed hypoechoic mass on grayscale imaging, correct? which has benign ultrasound features. I think it's not taller than wider. That means it's wider than taller. That means it's benign. I don't see any finger-like projections or nodularities coming off it, too. I don't see what else could be. I mean, if you looked at this, Piyush, would you directly or look at it and say, oh, it's a worrisome lesion? Or you'd say indeterminate? you say probably benign. What would you say? Probably. probably benign. Would everybody call this probably benign? And that's what they said. However, elastography demonstrates a heterogeneous, large, and stiff elastogram. So even I would call this a very benign lesion. But when the elastograms were, there were areas of red and orange within it. So this is not a benign lesion. This has got a stiff elastogram or a hard elastogram. And this patient definitely is 4A, if, and not at all a 2. So you upgraded that lesion right here. Now we come to the qualitative assessment when we are going to quantitative assessment when we talk about the numbers. Tell me when you want me to stop. I'll stop prematurely. We see a lot of yawns and all in the audience. 
Lesion stiffness can also be measured quantitatively with shear wave elastography. Stiffness of malignant lesions is generally greater than 80 to 100 kilopascal, while fat has relatively low elasticity values near 7 kilopascal, and breast parenchyma have elasticity values ranging from 30 to 50. So they kind of talk when I was reading these articles and making the um, uh, presentation because see I have no experience in real-time elastography myself so I was depending on reading a lot I realized that 80 is a golden number anything above 80 is not good anything that's below 80 is okay so 80 is like a big big number here however one must be careful when using kilopascal in lesion evaluation as some soft cancers may have low kilopascal values between 20 to 80 similar to benign lesions now that's the caveat and no uh, single modality is perfect but they're just giving you that there could be some tumors that are soft that don't generate so much of a desmoplastic reaction as do others. So let's just look at this elasticity score, okay? So uh, let's look at the uh, images that we are familiar with first, okay? So they're saying that this was noted to be a benign lesion, probably a cyst. This is again another benign lesion. This was probably a probably benign lesion because you have this oval out pouching. You see that a little finger-like projection coming off it. This was noted to be definitely malignant because so hypoechoic and you've got these finger-like projections and a lobulated margin. This was also noted to be very hypoechoic because it's densely fibrotic over here. And this was noted to be a benign cyst. So they are already giving, this is a, a score, elasticity score based on the numbers and uh, a scoring system essentially, you know, like you have Virads and some the other. So um, Sukuba also wanted to have something uh, uh, score-wise that you have a number assigned to which elasticity grade there is, so they graded this. Okay, so let's look at that. Okay, so on compression elastography, hard tissue appears blue and soft tissue appears red to green. So again, this is compression elastography. This is a reverse of shear wave elastography, okay? Remember all this while we said red was bad, red was bad, blue was good. Here, this is on compression elastography the harder tissues are appearing blue and the softer tissues are appearing red to green. So just have a complete reversal of what we were thinking about because we're not talking about shear wave elastography, we're talking about compression elastography. So a benign cyst is having red over here, correct? Blue, blue, blue. As your blue disappears, it becomes more and more benign. So if you go from highly malignant to highly benign, you're seeing that the blue is disappearing within the lesion. Is that accurate? And a totally benign lesion is red, right? So this is what their scale is. Uh, Sukuba's elasticity score one, two, one through five, and it is basically based on the color hues. You see that? The uh, appearance of the lesion, like you're saying, is it well demarcated, it's got lobulated margins, not known, is all seen on B mode imaging. But the Sukuba scaling is the reverse of the shear wave elasticity. Does that make sense? Now, the, the downfall. This is again one of the uh, caveats to it. Some cancers lack a significant desmoplastic reaction and may be soft, resulting in a false negative elastogram, right? We saw that. With shear wave elastography, some cancers may have a mean stiffness of 50 or less, normally supposed to have 80 or higher, but 50 or less. Similarly, some benign lesions may appear stiff, including hyalinized fibroadenomas, fat necrosis, and fibrosis. Does that make sense? So these are just some of the drawbacks that uh, some of the benign lesions may have higher or harder uh, values. So uh, we're back to shear wave elastography as red is very stiff, blue is not at all stiff. A heterogeneous mass with indistinct margins on grayscale ultrasound. So this is a heterogeneous mass, very poorly circumscribed, indistinct margins. Appears uh, stiff, heterogeneous, large, and suspicious on uh, definitely very, very suspicious or almost diagnostic on our shear wave elastogram, but the biopsy diagnosed this as just stromofibrosis, okay, just regular focal area of fibrosis. So elastography is picking up fibrosis. It's picking up desmoplastic reaction, which is nothing but fibrosis. So a densely air, thickened area of fibrosis will also appear red. So this is to show you what the uh, downfall is. Should we go ahead with the liver or should we do it uh, next time? Yes. Okay. So uh, remember, as any modality is uh, growing, or it takes birth, and then it uh, you know evolves over a period of years. 
So compression elastography was the very first elastography that was introduced. That was what started out with. And years later, shear wave elastography was given, you know, what evolved from it. Like, you know, you have basic sequences and you have higher sequences. Nowadays, all the machines only use shear wave elastography. But the reason I showed compression elastography is because it may be tested upon in the examination. Okay? So we're only doing shear wave and we only be using these uh, hues, we will only be using this, these hues of red to uh, blue. And we're using the Young's modulus, the number. So ultimately, when you do this, it'll generate a number. I'm going to show you that in my case slides to, uh, on my third lecture, where I'm just going to show you about 40 cases of breast, prostate, and liver elastography. But they'll generate a number, and then your reference can tell, OK, this is probably benign or not benign. So what should I do now? Uh, we're done with the breast, uh, the, ap the applications of elastography in the breast. Should we uh, do liver next week, I mean, next month, or next week, or should we do it now? It's as long as uh, breast. Yeah. OK, I'll do it now. I'm just seeing how many uh, slides do I have. Yeah, from, um, about 25 slides. Okay, very important, please pay attention. I know it's boring, but uh, we have to start somewhere, okay? Now, liver stiffness can be assessed by ultrasound and more res recently by MRI, okay? Uh, what did I do? Okay. So, um, ultrasound elastography is actually not even in vogue anymore in the sense it's uh, considered to be a little, um, you know, it's, it's in vogue since the last 10 years, and now the big thing is MRI elastography, and liver lesions can be assessed by both. So liver stiffness can be, uh, it, so what is this evaluated? Evaluates velocity of propagation of a shock wave within a liver tissue, <coughs> examines the physical parameter of liver tissue, which gets related, which is this elastic. It's pretty much the same thing. You're putting in an external wave or a shock wave, and you're seeing what is the deformation of the lesion within the liver tissue, and then to see what is its elasticity. Rationale. The normal liver is viscous using elasto elastogram um, uh, uh, language. Not favorable to wave propagation. Fibrosis increases the hardness of tissue. So that those basics we know already. So here we are not talking so much about focal liver lesions as much as we are talking about liver cirrhosis. Okay? So that is why they'll say normal liver is viscous. It lets the entire shock wave pass through as though it's just gel. The Fibrotic liver is the one that hardens the tissue and impedes or uh, the elastography shock wave. Does that make sense? So we're talking not about focal lesions. We're not in the breast anymore. We're talking more about liver hardening and talking about cirrhosis. So liver stiffness cutoffs in chronic liver disease. So that's what they're saying, that if you start low with kilopascals of 2 and go on to 75 kilopascals, this is what a normal liver is, you know, uh, green to yellow. Then there may be some fatty liver here. But as you go from red to brown, you're really into a hardened cirrhotic liver. Does that make sense? So these are the color hues of the liver. Okay? So green and yellow are normal liver, fatty liver, maybe some hepatitis, some inflammation. Then here you're really getting into the meat of it. You're getting into uh, hardened liver, cirrhosis, end-stage liver disease, so on and so forth. Can't I move it? I don't know what I did. I can't move the slides anymore. OK, I'll move it from here. All right, so we're talking about MR elastography. I need to touch upon it, even though that's not what my lecture is upon. It really, firstly, it starts by outlining the region of interest, as you can see over here, OK? You would definitely want to include the left hepatic lobe, because remember, in patients with cirrhosis, there is compensatory hypertrophy of the left hepatic lobe and atrophy of the right hepatic lobe. So this may be your normal liver, right? It's got a smaller left hepatic lobe and a larger right hepatic lobe. And this is your cirrhotic liver with so much of hypertrophy of the left and relative atrophy of the right. See, the spleen is diminutive in caliber. The spleen is very enlarged. The patient probably has associated portal hypertension. Okay, this is your conventional MRI images. Here you see the waves that are so 60 hertz is the oncoming shock pulse. 
or that is the magnitude of the wave that is uh, remember what kind of MRI in the MRI what kind of elastogram or what kind of elastography are we using anybody dynamic very good so only one uh, John was awake so in MRI you're using a dynamic elastogram right which is what happens yeah, so the dynamic one in which there's a continuous pulse of 60 megahertz that coming it's not a pulsed wave so look what happens here uh, does anybody remember our hues our hues were that the red and the brown were the worst remember on our uh, uh, scale that I showed you the red and the brown were the worst as you can see over here in the cirrhotic liver the more red hues you have the more brown hues you have the more cirrhotic it is and there you go this was a normal liver on the elastogram this is when the pulses are coming in right when the pulses are coming in you can decipher the pulses have a world or an onion skin appearance as they come in it's a continuous pulse so as they're coming in they have a world appearance in the liver okay but when you want to do your final measurements you will see that the red or the brown shows us how much more fibrotic or hardened the liver is as opposed to the greens the yellows and the blues that tell us how much viscous the liver is so looking at these images there is no need to do a random liver biopsy you know that this is a cirrhotic liver which is a hardened liver make sense I any questions No, it's not a static. Static uh, elastogram is where there is physical deformation. Here, this is just a vibration, just a vibration pulse. So that, what this correct. So there, uh, it, it is uh, in many M advanced MR elastogram that is inbuilt in the gantry itself. It provides a strong pulse that causes deformation coming from the gantry itself. However, that can be moved around in the donut depending on what organ you're interested in. Are you interested in the liver? Are you interested in the uh, spleen? You can move that around and that can cause the pulse uh, generation. It is not kept very proximal to the patient. It can generate the pulses uh, even at a distance. Okay, But it also does not have to have physical contact with the patient. Okay, I think we'll go do it next time. There's a lot, Dr. Sinasini, and we'll do it next time. Okay, thank you guys. Yes, yes, Abhishek. Yes, to uh, an MR elastogram is a one-stop shop for these hepatitis patients, which I would show, which I was going to be showing to you. Not only can they pick out focal mass lesions, which any regular MRI can pick up, is there a focal hepatic cell carcinoma, this, that, and the other. Second, so you can tell how much of uh, cirrhosis has built up all this while. Yes, it is. It is definitely uh, can replace ultrasound and biopsy combined for uh, diagnosis of hepatitis. So I'll continue next time with liver and.